Hello everyone, we continue to explore Malta. Today we'll see one of the most iconic structures of the archipelago, the famous Gigantia. Before the excavation of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey in the 90s was considered the oldest megalithic building in the world. Today it's still one of Europe's oldest freestanding buildings. We are leaving Malta proper to get to the island of Gozo by ferry. Then, from the port of Mrar, we will drive about 6 km northwest, deep into the island, to reach the Shara Plateau. It's like a gigantic puzzle made of massive irregular limestone blocks, built over 5,600 years ago. Its engineering craftsmanship contrasts with the roughness of the megaliths, as if casually arranged. There is something strange, unearthly about it. No wonder that for hundreds of years it was believed that it wasn't built by humans. What did Gigantia have to do with the race of giants and the mythical Atlantis? Today we'll learn its story and see it up close. Let's go! Gigantia is beautiful. Its walls look wonderful, especially from the western side. Gigantic raw stones arranged irregularly but in an orderly manner create a compact shape. A slightly bizarre, surreal effect complements the empty space of the landscape surrounding the complex. And most importantly, there is no modern protective shelter. An outer limestone wall rises to 6 meters. Some of the blocks weigh 50 tons and are among the largest used to build temples in Malta. Within these colossal walls are not one, but two temples. Temples don't communicate between them. Although they share a common facade, each of them has a separate entrance. The lower course was formed from huge stones standing vertically. The upper level of the walls consists of smaller, horizontally arranged blocks. The largest megaliths are up to 5 meters long. It's a real mystery how these Stone Age people transported such gigantic blocks. Perhaps they used round stones as rollers. Many of them of various sizes were found around the temple, just like in the Tarshin complex. Let's remember that all the temples in Malta were built without the use of metal tools and wheels. According to the prominent Maltese archaeologist, Sir Temistocles Zemit, temple builders had the following tools – quartzite and flint axes, obsidian knives, stone and wooden wedges, stone hammers and wooden levers. The entire temple was built of coralline limestone. Only some blocks inside were made of globigerina limestone, which was transported from the quarries 5 kilometers away. The large space between the outer temple wall and the outer enclosure walls was filled with rubble and earth. The southern temple is the oldest. It dates back to 3600 BC. It's also the best preserved. The condition of the temple is a real miracle, thanks to the use of huge megaliths in its construction. It's still standing although it was built during the times of proto-literate Uruk period, when the Sumerians built their first ziggurats, and in Egypt the Nakada One culture began to build their first adobe buildings. It's over a thousand years older than the Great Pyramid of Giza. So far, this is certainly the oldest building I've ever visited.
Of course, its interior was designed according to the clover leaf plan, typical of Malta. Adjoining the main passageway are five semicircular apses, and like the Nidra temple, which I showed you before, link in the description, it faces the equinox sunrise. The entrance is on a huge flat threshold slab. A massive block of stone is now covered with a wooden floor added in 2011. The hole in the middle of the large boulder could have been used for a purification ritual before entering the temple. The four holes in the inner upright slabs certainly held some kind of barrier, protecting whatever was inside. The temples of Malta weren't wide open. On the contrary, it seems that they were compact, difficult to access for people from outside. Although, as we know, the inhabitants of the archipelago didn't build defensive walls in Neolithic times, and no weapons from those times have ever been found here. So the sanctuary was protected for symbolic, probably religious reasons. Although one of the oldest megalithic temples, made of raw blocks, not perfectly adjacent to each other as in the later buildings of the Tarshin phase, Gigantia already has all the features typical of Maltese temples. The structure, in particular the external walls, are assembled mostly from megaliths without the use of any mortar. Concave facade, the main axis oriented to the southeast, and internal walls, forming pairs of lateral apses with horizontal blocks that corbel in to form dome-like structures. When the temple's pavements were uncovered in the 19th century, the raw walls of the apses were still covered with a hard layer of earth and clay. The stones were barely visible, as can be seen in the drawings from that time. After this natural layer was removed in the 20th century, traces of lime plaster were found on the apse walls, which may have originally covered the entire interior of the temple. So, thousands of years ago we wouldn't have seen these irregular, rough blocks, but smooth walls painted red. That's thanks to the layer of earth covering the walls of the apse that the red dye survived here and there on the plaster. The inner left apse and characteristic thrilitic niches. We don't know what they were used for. Some researchers see them as three altars of some cult of the divine triad. This is another unknown. The temple was built at a time when humanity didn't know writing, and the Maltese archipelago was isolated for almost another 3000 years. It was here that the famous Maltese architect from the 19th century, Giorgio Granier de Vasse, claimed to found mysterious inscriptions resembling a prehistoric alphabet. Granier de Vasse strongly claimed that his country was a remnant of the mythical Atlantis, and the islands of Malta, Comino and Gozo were in fact the peaks of the Atlantean mountains. Davase also claimed that the island of Ogygia, known from Homer's Odyssey, where Odysseus was detained by the nymph Calypso, is Gozo. Interestingly, some classicists agree with him even today. The so-called Calypso cave on the northern coast of the island is located just two kilometers from Gigantia. Hundreds of years ago, the remains of megafauna were found in Malta and Gozo, which supposedly led some discoverers to the rather surprising conclusion 
Gigantia must have been built by giants. You must have heard the story about the giants, that they built this temple. Why is it so? In the 18th, or it was in the 17th century, uh, here were found some large bones. Large blocks, large bones, giants. But as it turns out, bones belong to hippopotami and elephants. According to an old local legend, the inhabitants of the island of Gozo are the descendants of a giant woman named Sansuna. She was to marry one of the Gozitans and gave birth to a half-human, half-giant child. All the megalithic structures on the island were believed to be built by her. She was supposed to erect Gigantia to call forth rain. According to a legend, she carried huge blocks on her head or in her arms while carrying the baby on her back. And during these many kilometer journeys, she also spun cotton. The giantess ate only broad beans and honey, to which she owed her strength. But there came a time when the broad bean crop failed and Sansuna had nothing to eat. She became weak and over time died, leaving behind gigantic stone buildings. Gigantia in Maltese means giantess. In the past, the Maltese also called it giant's tower. As in Italian and British folklore, Neolithic ruins were also connected with stories about a race of giants perhaps stone figurines of fat women, many of which must have been found near temples in ancient times, inspired the legend of Sansuna. According to the 17th century Maltese historian Giovanni Francesco Abella, the Gigantia was an antediluvian structure of a race of giants. In the 18th century, it became an attraction for travelers visiting Malta. In 1777, the Tower of the Giants was formally protected by a local lord. In 1827, the British vice-governor of Gozo ordered the temple to be cleared of debris. These were the first works of this type in Malta. Unfortunately, the contents of the removed rubble, probably numerous ceramics and figurines, were lost forever. At that time, Gigantia was believed to be Phoenician or Punic ruins, but the English, who ruled the island from the 19th century, correctly associated the Maltese temples with the Neolithic buildings of Britain. We are now entering the second temple. The northern temple, although hundreds of years younger, also dates to the Gigantia phase of the temple period, which lasted from 3600 to 300 BC. However, according to some researchers, it belongs to the final Tarshin phase. It's also much smaller than the southern temple. A correspondence from 1828 has been preserved. A Captain W. H. Smythe, responsible for the excavation, writes to a befriended antiquarian. My dear sir, I beg to enclose you three drawings, a showing the situation and appearance of those primitive and colossal remains existing on the island of Goza, called the Giant's Tower by the natives. I'm only able to send you the mer views, because the measurements I took and the remarks I made upon the spot were given to my late friend, Colonel Otto Bayer, the then resident governor. 
To this gentleman we owe the clearing out of these antiquities, and it was his intention to have submitted to the public a very detailed account of his operations, but sudden death frustrated the measure. He further writes, I may briefly state that the enclosed sketches give the appearance of the giant's tower sufficiently exact for those conversant in what are called druidical or Celtic structures to estimate their probable uses. Mainly 19th century graffiti left by adventurers are still visible on the inner blocks of the temple. Several watercolors dating back to the first half of the 19th century have been preserved. They reveal features and structures within the temple that have been irretrievably lost. Further archaeological and conservation works were carried out by Sir Themistocles Zamit, almost a hundred years later. The originally roofed complex was much higher. Gradually narrowing towards the interior of the temple, the corbelling rings of horizontal external blocks created an incomplete dome-shaped structure. Unlike, for example, Mycenaean tombs, Tholoi, they didn't close completely, and the several meter long opening in the ceiling was probably covered with longitudinal blocks of stone, laid flat. With such a domed roof, Maltese temples might have resembled beehives from a distance. Unfortunately, the furnishings of the northern temple haven't survived to this day, apart from the primitive altar. So far, I've shown you the most famous temple complexes of the Maltese islands – Tarshin, Ajarim, Nidra and Gigantia, but there are many more of them here. There are about a thousand ancient sites on this tiny archipelago, many remains of Stone Age temples, often inaccessible to tourists, located in private fields, remote, hard-to-reach places. I had the opportunity to visit only a few of them. A little-known place in northern Malta, the Taladi Temple, the only Maltese temple that's not oriented to the southeast. These stones look like a dolmen, but this isn't their original position. The temple dates to the Tarshin phase, from around 3300 to 3000 BC. It's in poor condition, destroyed by local farmers in the past, and only modest remnants have survived. It was here that the famous limestone slab was found, a Neolithic map of the sky or, as others say, a lunar calendar. The Shemshia Temple. In the previous video I showed you the local Punic and Roman tombs. There's also a Neolithic temple. Or rather, its remains. We don't know anything about it because the place hasn't been excavated yet. I wonder what's underneath. The next temple is unique. It's located near the beach of the tourist town of Bujiba and lies on the premises of a hotel. The Dolman Hotel owes its name to it, if only it were a dolmen, but it's not. It's just a temple from the Tarshin phase, discovered of course by Zamit in 1920.
Large stones scattered in the field have been reconstructed. Part of the coralline limestone facade has survived to this day, as well as unique reliefs depicting fish. They can be admired today in the museum in Valletta. It's the only temple I've ever seen that it's located inside a hotel. It's free of charge, but you have to ask at the hotel reception where it is. Over time, an entire city was built around the temple and it itself was incorporated into the grounds of the hotel. I must admit that the ruins look beautiful as part of a garden surrounded by swimming pools. Thank you for watching. If you enjoy our historic journeys, please subscribe to my channel, leave a comment and share my video with your friends. If you want to help me continue this, please join my Patreon community, link in the description. Thank you all for supporting me by sending super thanks here on YouTube. I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons. Thank you so much. You guys are the greatest. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're new here, I recommend you to watch my videos from Egypt, Turkey, Greece and Italy. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel to be up to date with new episodes. And see you on another ancient site!